but I suppose it's interesting how the artists will have a perspective of their work and then other people bring all different perspectives. And that's so, that's part of the thing about it. That's what's so exciting. Yeah. Well, One of the, the, painter, the painters that I follow, he said, you know, your painting is never finished until someone else interacts and interprets it. And you never want it to be so obvious that no one else can think anything else than right. what you've brought. Yeah. Because they're helping to complete the work of art okay. by their own interpretation. Well, welcome to Take This Joy. I have a special guest with me today. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce her to you. Uh, Wendy, uh, Wendy Duffield has been a good friend of mine for some time now. And I have a lot of respect for her art. She's um, similar to me. She uses a, a, a lot of different media. Uh, she creates in two-dimensional as well as three-dimensional uh, modes. And some of her works are tiny books that you can wear around your neck. Some are interesting sculptures and others take the form of mixed media pictures that take the viewer on a journey. Did I miss anything, Wendy? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so aside from making her art, Wendy takes the time to teach young people and adults and has been known to organize a craft fair or two. Uh, she came to uh, Vancouver Island from Australia, but prior to that, she grew up in Alberta, Canada. And so Alberta is something we have in common. Wendy also got her uh, bachelor at U of A, something I also did, but she got her bachelor in fine arts, whereas my bachelor was in education with a minor in fine arts. So welcome to take this joy, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much here. for having me. <laughs> Pardon? Thanks very much for having me. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm so glad you could come. Okay, so we're Zooming today. And I'm just going to start looking at the questions. So I guess we'll just start at the top and, and work our way down. So do you, besides being an artist, you also teach? And I know that you stopped for a while uh, during COVID, but have started again. And are you doing a lot of teaching right now? And do you want to do more? And is that too many questions to ask at once? <laughs> well, you're an excellent host. So <laughs> maybe I'll go to my notes that I prepared earlier. Okay. <laughs> Well, so, actually, I, I do enjoy teaching, um, especially teaching the medium of collage, because it's my favorite medium personally. Right. Um, and I would love to do more teaching. But at the moment, I have a part time job to pay mm. for supplies, naturally. Of course. And I've also got a new part time job as a facilitator for a locally seniors group. Oh, it's wow, called yeah. Arts and Spirituality. That sounds so interesting. They meet, they meet every Monday. And I underestimated how much time and effort that was going to take to organize the speakers and activities each week so it's really interesting um but between that and my working job I don't really have a lot of time left to do much teaching mm. but as people approach me because I have a website and they say we'd like to study this or take a class with you I'll organize it but I used to teach through panorama regularly which is down in Sydney here <clears throat> but as you know, teaching takes a lot of time and the presentation is the least amount of time of all the teachings. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, now that you brought up that seniors thing, can you just tell us a little bit about what that is? So I work at a local church. I'm not a member of the congregation, but I'm their office administrator. And the new minister got a grant to offer more programs for the community, recognizing that there were less and less people coming to church, but she wanted to maintain an engagement with her community. So this, the idea to have a weekly hour and a half long session for people to gather mm -hmm. and share companionship and share ideas. So each month I'm organizing a theme. Last month was all about First Nations arts and culture. Oh. So we had a series of videos that we watched to learn about their language and their spiritual practices. And then we did some activities, included making a little leather pouch. And this month, it's all about self-compassion. And I've got an art therapist oh, that's coming wonderful. for two of the meetings. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Next week, of course, we're, well, no, next month, I was going to say, it's about growing older. And mm. I've got a speaker from the University of uh, Victoria coming. Mm -hmm. And then the following month, it's poetry month. So we've got a couple of poets coming. 
Wow. So it's been really interesting for me personally, probably even more than the participants, because I have to do all the background research because I want to make sure they get maximum bang for their time, both wow. the speakers and the participants. And it's free for people to come, which is why we've got the grant. So the grant pays for my salary and the speakers. Nice. That's yeah. really cool. All right. Okay. I, I don't think I ever asked you before, but um, when did you know you wanted to become an artist? Um, always. I think always. It was the only I've, only thing I really ever imagined doing. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Um, and so I was uh, very happy with my own company didn't need to go out and play was very happy just sitting in my room and drawing and um <laughs> I was such a self-confident little artist that I didn't think I needed art lessons so it took me a few wells to, to actually take up art when I got to high school right. but when I did my art teacher was excellent and he encouraged me and he helped me to put together my portfolio to actually apply for universities it, in Thinking back on it, you know, I years later, I thought, I really wish I could get back in touch with him and let him know how much I appreciated mm. his um, support yeah. and confidence in me. Yeah. And you never do these things when you can and when no. people are still alive. And he's oh. not alive anymore. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, I, I was not into sports. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's interesting because it seems to me that a lot of artists, I've always known they wanted to be artists. It took me a while to get to the point to being confident enough to call myself an artist, though. Probably took 50 years to get oh, to that yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. I think I, yeah, yeah. I was a little younger than that, but yeah, you get to a certain point and you're like, I'm an artist. I make art, you know? <laughs> and all those questions are kind of complex. And I suppose um, as I'm getting, um, as I'm getting older, I'm feeling less anxious about looking at those topics Good. um yeah, yeah which yeah. is like that's one of the benefits of getting older is you can pack up some of the baggage that was bugging you and you can tackle new baggage like yeah oh, are you really an artist <laughs> well it's so funny because it, you know we so so often we make these little decisions in childhood and we and this is the programming that we're going by and going by and we're going down these train tracks and suddenly we st look down at the train tracks and go how long have I been doing this? And and how old was I when I decided this? And was it true then? Is it still true? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I think I'm stepping off this train now. <laughs> you know, and then you're like, oh, I'm free. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry, my own sidetrack there. Uh, yeah, I, no. <laughs> so what has been, well, I guess you kind of talked about it. Um, I, what your path to art was you sort of already said you that was always what you wanted to do and that you had um yeah and and the, so I did get accepted in university into three different ones and in in the end after I came out to Victoria and looked at the program here I looked at I went to University of Alberta I never went out east to explore that one but in the end because I was still I was only 17 and I decided the best course for me was U of A which had a very prescriptive program they expected that you studied fine arts or pardon me um that you studied art history and drawing those were core subjects you didn't have a choice and oh. then you picked your electives so for me that gave me a really solid foundation of art skills in my, for my you know toolkit yeah then I um I got a job straight out of uni as a graphic artist at a, at a printing company in Red Deer and I oh. saved up my money and went to Europe and I, I traveled by myself. When I came back, I just was so enamored of the people that I'd met that I decided to get a job at a youth hostel because I thought I can't leave that tribe behind. I've had so much fun meeting new people from new cultures, new languages, new countries that I thought I got to get a job at a YHA. I moved out to Victoria, got my job and um, met my first husband. And then because he was Australian, uh, I, I started following him and moved to London for a few years, eventually moved to Australia, 
all those years of traveling, you're sort of just making enough money to keep going and have adventures. Yeah. So it wasn't until I actually moved to Australia that I started thinking about art again. Mm. And I- so You sort of found yourself away from the art for quite a while. Yeah, I yeah. definitely did. I mean, you keep sketching and you, and you do crafts and things, but by the time we'd moved and settled into Brisbane, Australia, um, I was really feeling that, you know, some people feel a bit anxious if they haven't read a book in a while, or some people feel anxious if they haven't gone for a trip, trip traveling, you know. Um, but for me, I started to get anxious because I wasn't making anything. I wasn't doing anything with my hands. So yeah. I signed up to do um, an adult education program at, they call them TAFE there. It's like adult continuing education okay. in Australia. And I did an a introduction to jewelry making with a lady named Frances, who is from the former Czechoslovakian Republic. Okay. She was really cool. She was already at that time about 70. She was an excellent teacher. And I found that I had a natural aptitude for some of the jewelry making skills. Like I was very good at piercing, which means, you know, you drill. And this is an example of my piercing. Oh, side with no piercing. But I can, I can cut imagery out of silver out of metal and I was good at that so eventually um I did the jewelry I made jewelry I made all sorts of weird and I'll show you. oh yeah oh oh hey so, now that looks so like that a little crab is, and it's got yeah, some stones with in it. stones stones inset that's really and cool. and this is my archaeopteryx with a little stone so it's as if oh, he's an wow. egg yeah. Rounding his little silver skeleton. Oh. So I made jewelry. I like making jewelry. Then you got bored with making jewelry. So then I started making. This is my business card holder series. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so it's a so, little bit more functional. So did you ever see Inspector Rex in Canada? No. No. Um, is that Australian? It's just, it, no, it's it's an Austrian detective series. And Rex oh. is a police dog. He's a German shepherd. Okay. And so Inspector Commissar Rex in, in Austrian or German, um, it was a series that we watched in Australia for years and years. It was fantastic. Oh. And so I did a whole series of Inspector Rex items. So Rex is Rex is leading him on. And here's yeah. Rex. And Rex is saying no. No, <laughs> I'm not coming with you. That's kind of looks like blue in me once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's fun it was fun to create something which is quite highly narrative I, I think yeah. we were going to talk about sort of my style and yeah always my style has been I think has involved storytelling yeah um but I did the formal stuff with the jewelry and made rings and so on and then I went into the little objects and then I was taking classes at McGregor Summer School which is um, a live-in, two-week, immersive art program, which is everything from writing stories to making furniture to, you mentioned just before, um, felting to ju making jewelry, performance. Oh, it's a brilliant, it's a, it's a full realm of um, arts, performing arts and visual arts. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to that for a few years and... During that time, I was studying with a jeweler, but I was already starting to get a bit, just a bit bored with making jewelry. And it was there that, because we were surrounded by so many musicians, and I had this idea, I wanted to make music boxes. And so I created, and I said to, I was speaking to the musicians, and I said, so I've got this music mechanism, and if I place the mechanism in a wooden box, you know, those little wind-up ones, yeah. that you can you can create your own chamber to make it resonate and make oh. it louder wow and that's when I started to make these little boxes so um, is there a way to make that one play music yeah we might not get it to stop so this one is oh and I can't hear it but that's okay but it does it does play music yeah making the jewelry boxes I guess was the culmination of my formal jewelry making process and then uh, I took a break from doing anything for a few years and I there was some 
stuff going on in my head as it does happen to lots of people yeah. and stopped for a while and then my mum still living in Canada at the time and I was over in Australia she said I've heard of this you know at McGregor there's a, a teacher coming and he makes jewelry from found objects and when I looked into it I thought wow you know the lights go off in your head oh and yeah say, that's, that's oh yeah that's my next thing so yeah. my next thing became things out of found objects so Ooh. this is a little metal box yeah it's been pierced. So you're still using your, that must be like, you, do you, you use like a jeweler saw or whatever to cut? Yes. It? So this is what piercing is where you, yeah. you drill the hole and then you cut That's out the shape. Beautiful. Using found objects. It's funny because I've been collecting found objects since university, since high school. And when I met Keith and I started pursuing jewelry from found objects, then I had all these objects already sitting, waiting to be used and made into something else. So that was, that was yeah. a wonderful journey. Yeah. Then we moved to Canada and then all my stuff was in transit. And that's what started the collage series. And so that we've been here five years now. And in that time, again, I've changed my mediums again, but I suspect people might still recognize my work, even though it's, a completely different medium i'm not right. sure right so what is your current medium then it's this more sculptural is that so after after i'd done the collages i can't recall why i decided to try paper clay sculpture this was so this was this was happening through covid and i was still making collages and i was still i was very fortunate to still be able to organize group exhibitions during those short periods when we'd open up for a bit and then we'd close down. Yeah. And, and you were in one of my exhibitions before. Yeah. We had COVID. But that's how we met. Yeah. At some point last year, something prompted me to look into paper clay sculpture. And yeah. so last year I, I went off on this weird tangent and was taking my found objects. In this case, this found object was a Christmas bauble and started applying the paper clay to it. Oh my God. Christmas bauble has old lights from a camera i have what? not seen that piece yet i have a funny feeling i have to come and see one of your shows i haven't been for a while and then because i'm i'm an addicted hoarder of cool found objects and i'm i go through periods where i might spend a few months every day looking on use victoria oh wow! And so i've managed to get some really cool stuff now one fellow was giving away a whole piano keyboard and this is the, these are some of the bits from that piano keyboard, which oh, wow. became the stand for this piece. Oh my gosh. Um, so cool. And this piece, what's one of the things about it is that there are, there are actually transparent elements in it. Yeah. And there are holes drilled into the piece so that if you know where to look through the piece, you will see through to the other side. So it's as if there's a galaxy inside oh of this. Gosh. So that when you look out, you can see other stuff. It's a bit hard to illustrate that here. Yeah. But yeah. That's the idea of that. Wow. So this, this project of just experimenting then led and morphed into let's make some creatures. And, and, I, and the, the creatures were just for fun. And I made, I guess about seven or eight. And I was really surprised because at my last group exhibition last September, they really resonated with people. And I was surprised how popular they were and yeah. how many went to new homes. Yeah. And so in a way that made me, um, I was comfortable then to create more creatures yeah. because I, I didn't feel I was done making creatures. Good. Um, so this is, this is one of my, current this is this one of this is a, a this year creature yeah now um, can i ask yeah do, your, do do these creatures have like i know in in your past um like your collage and stuff like that i know that they've had stories attached to them yeah uh, do these creatures have some stories attached to them too or are they sort of their own creatures i suppose these creatures are in initially what they came about because 
I just wanted to use my hands. I wanted to start something and see where it ended up. And for whatever reason, these are what ended up. These rather giraffe-like critters mm -hmm. with emu faces, because as you know, I've got two pet emus. Yeah. Um, and the creatures last year, I sort of felt, in my mind, they developed a history and a backstory, which, as I've uh, as I mentioned, well, to you, sometimes I'm story. happy. I was I was happy. I'm happy to share the backstory that I've imagined, but sometimes people bring their own story mm -hmm. to a piece when they look at it, and so I don't like to impose that upon them. But if people would ask, so the the creatures I made last year all had specific names and sometimes I feel like the title of a piece gives a, a clue to your narrative yeah but it also might send someone off on a completely different tangent right and it's interesting because there is a lady that that I know who's a poet and she loves making these things that she calls grimoires which are little books of spells okay but yeah that's what a grimoire yeah. was yeah and in a way I was sort of imagining that these are well, they're not living, but they're living three-dimensional grimoires oh. that they cast spells or that they are carriers of ancient spirits or something. Mm -hmm. That's what I was imagining when I created wow. them. Yeah. And and I, I, I like to suggest that they do have their own time and space, whether that's something historical or legendary like king arthur or dinosaur age or whether it's something yeah. from a parallel universe yeah, those exactly. are things going through in my mind whether someone else might just come along and say oh well maybe she plays dungeons and dragons and that's why she makes strange dinosaur things i don't know <laughs> yeah. but for yeah. me for me that's part of the fun of it is that when you're in the groove and you're creating and you're saying well what expression is this creature going to have and does his neck turning a certain way? Is he turning around to look at something? What might he be looking at? For me, those things flow through my head, but I'm not necessarily aware of them unless someone asks me. And it's kind of interesting. It's in the process of reflecting on this discussion today that I thought, yeah, there's a lot going through your head at the time yeah. that you're not necessarily conscious of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, and then those pieces, they look like they all have their own personality to each character. Yeah. 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 Well, that's really cool. But you so, were talking about, um, during my collage series. So one of, and we've talked about this before that one of the things is that, um, when I have a backstory and for example, in uh, 2018, uh, a clergyman in Australia, the Cardinal in Australia, the most highest Catholic member of the church, he was convicted of um, child abuse. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, that was taken back to court and they appealed. And so there is a lot of information coming from Australia about that. There are documentaries being made. And that prompted me to create a series of collages where I was thinking about the victims of that abuse. And so I had a number of collages which had photographs of children as part of the imagery. Right. And in sometimes when I would speak to people, I might share that story, depending on what kind of feedback I was getting from them. Yeah. But other times I was very happy for them to make a completely different association. Yeah. You know, and, and people would, because this is when you're at an exhibition and you have the opportunity to, to interact with people and say, someone would say, oh, that just reminds me of my son when he was a little boy. Yeah. And you say, well, there's no point in bringing in the others, the other um, narrative. Into a darker that. narrative, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. But, but I suppose it's interesting how the artist will have a perspective of their work and then other people bring all different perspectives and that's some, that's part of the thing about it that's what's so exciting yeah well, one of the the painter the painters that I follow he said you know your painting is never finished until someone else 
interacts and interprets it. And you never want it to be so obvious that no one else can think anything else than right. what you've got. Yeah. Because they're helping to complete the work of art okay. by their own interpretation. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I like that because I definitely always have my own interpretation when it comes to my art. But I, I welcome other points of view on it and because then it, it just it just enriches the whole meaning right like is there a piece of art that you have that you'd like to share a story with us about just to give people an idea of what your narrative sometimes is like maybe one of your figures that you could tell the backstory of that or or well, you had those collages of those women yeah there's well I, well what I was what I was thinking I'll put up a picture of um there's a collage that I did, which, um, for the show last year, and it's called Complicated Memories, and I'll put a picture of that up. Okay. I should have got it because it's in the living room. It's a piece. Every once in a while, there'll be a piece that I've created that I can't let go of, and this was one of those pieces for me, mm. um, because I, I usually always am thinking, as I mean, I'm in in love with it while I'm creating it and I'm I still enjoy it when it's done but I can let it go but sometimes I can't and this piece was called complicated memories <clears throat> and it's a photograph of a mother and daughter standing in front of a car and I'd say I guess it's from the 1950s okay. it's black and white it's a yeah. photograph about it. it's big and the mother and daughter have actually been removed from the image so there's just the silhouette of them standing in front of the car. Oh, okay. And it's it's a collage in front of um, some jelly plate printing and I've stitched on it and I've sewn ephemera on top of it. And to me, the outline of the mother and the daughter and the title, Complicated Memories, it's about my own childhood. Um, although I wasn't born in the 50s, I feel as if the relationships we have with our parents have been influenced by the relationships that they had with their parents. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and the lens we have as a young person growing up changes over time with the, with the experiences we have as we go through different ages. Yes. And I can, and so a conversation I may have had with a parent as a youngster, I interpret a certain way when I'm young. Then when I reflect on it, I gain different insights about that same conversation. And yeah. then when we repeat the conversation, when we get older, then we get new insights. And yeah. the whole, the relationship we have with our parents is so complicated. And, and sometimes I think the memories of our, of past interactions cloud and mess up. The relationship and so sometimes yeah. I think about how if we can live long enough we can clarify perhaps what the relationship was back then and then it can grow now yeah and so this we little can, piece about the complicated memories and yeah. it is we can understand it kid. we can understand it better every all the time you know and then all of a sudden you know and then there if there's things that we need to let go at that point then we can kind of yes yeah yeah that's really cool yeah. I like that. Very deep and in, in cool. <laughs> Insightful. That's the word. <laughs> All right. So do you have a favorite type of material that you like to work with? Or does it just depend on what you're doing now? Well, um, I would have to say found objects are my favorite thing because um, it's interesting. Like I, I, we've had this conversation before with you about how sometimes you paint your canvases completely with the color before you start yeah. I know some people don't like to start with a blank canvas so they'll do prep work and for me sometimes it's a found object which triggers a memory or a thought that will take me off on a tangent that if I was just sitting in at my desk doodling it wouldn't come to me the thought wouldn't come to me so it's these found objects that trigger something which then I grab another bit and then I start auditioning these disparate bits together yeah. which lead to a whole new idea and yeah. it's so exciting so the found object is my most important thing um 
you know, everywhere I look, and it is scary in a way, but <laughs> there's junk everywhere. I've got years of detritus. I've got years and years of junk. And you never know when one piece of junk is going to yell at you across the room and say, I need to be used now because it's going to fit with what you're doing. And that's how it works for me. Huh. Cool. Okay. Can't even, I don't even know what to say about that. Cause I was just sort of like thinking and comparing it with mine. And it's, I think it's totally different. My, my, um, the way I do it, but I like that idea. How, because, because it, it's like a trigger and then all of a sudden you can build on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, I always find it, it's so interesting when I, when I see someone, some people are very satisfied to go out into nature and paint or sketch or they sit in a cafe and sketch and paint and then those will be their their activities and then that will generate ideas and they'll compose something on a piece of canvas and it becomes a painting yeah and I, i've been challenged by my mom and my husband you know i make little collages and mm -hmm. they said maybe you should make you know try making something bigger yeah but it doesn't it and so i will start on a 16 by 20 canvas and with good intentions and ideas and then when i finish and i just like i but i the edges are not resolved and i'm really unhappy with the end result because what because and what you're I, focusing on is this little piece probably right yeah you know, it's interesting that's another one of those things where everybody's like oh you should work bigger you should work bigger and I don't think that works for everybody. I think there's people that just have to work small because that's, I don't know. It's just their mode, you know, their modality yeah. they work in. And I don't like, like these people that say you have to work big. Well, like why? <laughs> well, and, it, and it's fascinating because there are people that work big and it's magical and they'll never touch a small brush. They like it, giant brushes. Yeah. Um, and I agree. I just, some of us are drawn to the small and intimate and others yeah. can go large. Yeah. And I think, and I, to me, the only reason to go big is because you can get more money from it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and for me, because the ephemera, the bits are so important. So those little old black and white photos are only that large. Oh yeah. Unless you artificially enhanced it in some way. Yeah, you can't you take it, it up or something. and the stamps and the bits of broken jewelry oh, and yeah. you know the light bulbs and the fittings you can't, all make those things, bigger. you can't make them bigger and and it's the it's the quality of the actual thing itself which brings so much to the piece so you you're limited to the size of the piece yeah. by what you're using by what your medium is in that in that case yeah. oh interesting so oh wow okay do your do your pictures and assemblage, assemblages and sculptures do they speak to the viewer at all about who you are? I don't I don't honestly know. I That's something don't. you've thought about maybe before. No, it's interesting. Um like the reaction I get from people when I've sat at exhibitions is one, they imagine I must have a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so I they do. know that about me. <laughs> they know that they know that they and and they know that i have an active imagination but it's interesting because I, i'm not a writer and so whilst while someone who's not a visual person would look at someone who's the output of a visual person and say well you must have an active imagination as a person who doesn't write obviously I look at writers and I say, my God, you've got such a wonderful imagination oh, <laughs> because yeah. you can, you can well, create a world with words. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's just a different modality, right? Like hmm. you're, if you're more of a visual person, that's how you'll express yourself. But if you're more verbal, then yeah. you're great, you know? Yeah. 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 Or a musician or yeah. a singer. Yeah. There's so many modes of expressing yourself. And, yeah. um, and, and I suppose, um, it wasn't until maybe the last five years that I'm comfortable saying 
that I am a storyteller because I'm not a storyteller in the sense that I write a book or a short story or an essay. But I think that my output does suggest stories. I hope it does. Yeah, I think it does. Well, you know, because it's funny because I was thinking, um, so the collages, the collages came after my foray into making the wearable books. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, this book, which is called um, Principles, because mm. the front page of the book is taken. This is from a nursing textbook. It's an old nurse textbook. Okay. So there is images of the human body, the, the alveoli from the lungs. Okay. And as I was creating this little, it they were just pages in the book. There was no plan. And the pages are all created separately before the book goes together. But as I started to put the book together, the story, I don't know, because you're an Alberta kid. Did you read yeah. Flowers of Algernon when you were in school? Yeah, we did. Yeah. And I yes. asked that of a lot of people and a lot of people didn't. So maybe it was just Alberta curriculum, but yeah. flowers for Algernon. Um, when no, I started, I'm, I'm wondering was... if we should if we should let the viewers know what flowers for Algernon, what oh, yeah. the general outline of that. Because if I remember correctly, that was uh, the story of a man who um, was given a chance to get smarter. Is that right? And and um, it was a medical thing that they had come up with, and so they gave him that, and it, and over time he get got progressively smarter and smarter and smarter and then all of a sudden it stopped working and then he lost that intellect yeah yeah and and in the story Algernon is a little mouse okay yeah and the mouse is a test subject and then the mouse becomes the pet of the man who participates in the medical study okay yeah and, I don't remember and, obviously the whole thing <laughs> yeah and eventually Algernon dies Oh. Um, Algernon loses his faculties and so the human subject realizes that this is likely going to happen to him and yeah. so this little book which was started with human anatomy textbook and then as I say as I audition bits and pieces from my collection my bass collection and I found I had I hold a, had a whole bunch of pages from um, an eight from a a bible study book from oh. the 1800s oh my and 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 so I had these beautiful copper plate etchings which had angels and things and for some reason those angel pictures got integrated into this book about the story of the poor rat dying and the man dying and yeah and our journey on earth of getting wisdom and losing wisdom and <laughs> from birth to old age and everything yeah. else it all just becomes part and 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 so while this book to me has a narrative I, unless I explained what I was thinking of as as I was creating it I guess someone picking it up wouldn't necessarily no. make out this yeah <laughs> no you wouldn't but, from um, those pictures you wouldn't but I mean as you see the pictures now you can like you can see where the pictures come from right with the stories and the what, and well, you, I think the connections are easy to be seen once you know what the, you know, yeah. If I, if I gave you the narrative, you'd make the connections, but. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so I think when people, when I talk about my little books and, yeah, they say you must have a good imagination, but I think we all do. We just find different ways of expressing it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, even those people that say, oh, I'm not creative. Ah, uh, yeah, you are. You just have your own way. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and sometimes that creativity might be making new recipes for your family. Mm. You know? Oh, yeah. Maybe all sorts of things. Well, yeah. I mean, and it's like um, just talking about myself and my family, like my mom was um, very creative. Like she I mean, she drew and stuff like that. She didn't do a lot of artwork, but I mean, that's she's kind of the person that got me started, I think, doing like drawing flowers and faces and stuff like that. And then um, and she was creative in the kitchen. And then and then um, like I look at my dad and like and my brother and they're in the welding shop and how creative they were with just problem solving. Problem solving is is hugely creative. Yes. Like when, you, when you have to uh, build something in your and it's kind of something new because you're trying to fix somebody else's problem. Like there's yeah. creativity there. Like, because where does that idea come from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So anyway. Yeah, I think all, yes, if you're right. Like problem solving, you know, any description 
involves creativity. Yeah. And so even, yeah, even a person who's brilliant at organizing events or activities or like they're highly creative, but it's yeah. coming out in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we are all creative. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. So why is art important? What, what value do you think it has to the world? For me, um, I only, I suppose, take quite an egocentric view of it. I don't, I, I don't, want to comment necessarily on what value it has to the world because I think everyone's going to define what the value of art is individually. Art of itself as an expression of human beings I think is one of the most valuable things that we give to our fellows. I think it helps us connect with each other but I've never really asked a person why do you have art why do you buy my art? Mm. I suppose if I reflect on why do I buy other people's art? And I have, when I had a nice corporate job and I had a really good salary, I bought lots of art. I have some of your art. Yeah, and you so, do. You're one of my collectors. <laughs> yeah. And, and I buy the artwork because I like to be surrounded by things that make me feel something. Mm. Well, I think like what you said about connection, human connection, um, like the person looking at your art has a connection to you because they're seeing inside of your soul and in your, your heart and your, your mind um, by just seeing what you put on that paper, right? Or, mm. what, you know, and with my people, like if you can kind of, I think like for myself, like I think people can see into my soul in that, just that, I mean, I do a lot of natural world things. I mean, even if they're a little bit fantastical, I mean, both of those things sort of speak to who I am in that, like, I love, excuse, sorry. I love um, the natural world. I love gardening. I love um, things, but I also, I also like the idea of magic a little bit. I like the idea of being a little bit fantastical and, and, you know, being outside of the box and making my flowers look a little bit more, I don't know how to, how to describe that a little bit more full of motion and, and you know what I mean? That sort of thing. Um, yeah. Well, okay. So, and just one other thing that occurred to me when you're talking about connection with artists is like in some respects, because I really like Van Gogh, I'm connecting with him through the years. Like you can connect with the old masters and see into them, into their psyche through their art as well. For me, as a adult who never had children, who had this, you know, I, I want to be useful to the planet while I'm on the planet, mm. but I also want to, I want, I want there to be a sign that I was here on the planet yeah. where, and a person who's got kids, I, I, I think a lot of people see their children as their legacy. Their legacy. And I sort yeah. of had that in the back of my mind, you know, children yeah. are your legacy, yeah. but not having had them, I'm, well, what is, what will be my legacy? What will yeah. be the mark that yeah. I've been here? Yeah. That's an, of course, that's um, another thing we have in common. And, and yeah, I totally, I resonate with that, you know. I mean, but that's just your ego, I suppose. Someone else some might degree, say, well. I suppose. Huh? Yeah. To some degree, yeah. Because, uh, you know, if you're a useful, helpful person, why should you have to leave something behind? Your kindness was your legacy. But for me, I'm driven I'm, I'm vain. I want there to be something behind of me. Yeah. You know, I don't uh, know if it's know, necessarily going to get to museum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. Interesting. Hmm. But that's why I've self-published my book. I self-published a book of did? the Collage Girl series. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, here. So I've created 54 collages during my collage girl series. Right, yeah. And um, about half of those, I suppose, have been sold. But I've now made a book. I've published it myself. Wonderful. And so each, has each, each girl has a story, right? Each girl has a story. And each girl and so, has a, a collage. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. And so the, the I've got a, a little run of the book and I've, 
sold a few of these books, and now I know, and, and look, and I even, this is, this is more vanity, but I've written a book, so now I actually have a dedication. Oh. So I've now been able to dedicate my little book to three important people in my life, which is another thing that I wanted. I, it's now in the world, this thing, and there might only ever be 10 copies, and they might turn to dust. But one day, somehow, somewhere, someone might pick up this wee book and then see there's this connection of me and then these other three people and know that this was important to someone yeah you know yeah. Yeah, and and sure. it's interesting how sometimes these things can alter our view like all of a sudden I felt a little bit of a weight had lifted off that I had done this oh and it's peculiar I, I, I acknowledge it's peculiar. I no, I don't think so. I think it, it means that that was something you really, really were needing and wanting to do. Yeah, which is, again, it all sounds kind of vain, but that's that's what's going through my aging brain. Oh. <laughs> you know, I would highly encourage artists. Sure, it feels a bit vain and self-indulgent, but it, it, if you're worried about recognition, in some respects, this exercise makes me feel a bit liberated from that. I don't necessarily now worry that I will become discovered, per se. I have less of that Protestant work ethic. It's no good unless you make your mark. Yeah. In a way, this little vanity piece issue. has just, <laughs> yeah, it, it just means that there is something that will sit in a shelf somewhere and I know that collages themselves resonated with some people hmm. and, and the fact that the collection now is preserved in some way, it's my little contribution, I suppose. Of course. My yeah. I think we've just about, I think we've just about covered it all now. Sorry. I was just like, whoosh. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's good. It, it, um, it was more interesting than the way I asked my questions. So I think so. And sadly, I suspect you'll have to do some editing. Oh, and I will. I'll edit out, <laughs> like, I'll probably edit out this little part while we're talking about it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that was really great. I'm so glad we got a chance to do this. Um, I learned a little bit more about you. And and as always, that's a good thing. So, and it was also good to just talk with you. So, oh, oh where can viewers see more of your art? <laughs> I do have a website and it's www.wduffieldartwendyduffield.com. Okay. Okay. I am on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. Okay. Thanks so much for being my guest this week on Take This Joy, Wendy. We'll talk soon. Moi. <laughs> Thanks. See and, Brenda. To all, and to all the viewers, thank you for coming along on this little journey with us. And I hope you have an amazing heart, hearty, how do you do that? Heart month, like happy. I, everybody, Valentine's Day has been and gone, but hope you all had a good one. And we'll talk to you soon. In the meantime, take this joy. Love y'all. Bye for now.